Paul Lister, I finally have grabbed you and get you on our conscious <laughs> podcast because you're not an easy man to to find. Yeah. You're always all over the world doing important things. Well, I'm, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it's so good to have you on though and finally get to have this conversation. You and I first met when we were um, working together on a conservation program about Belize, a place close to your heart. Correct, yeah. Um, but would it be fair to say the first half of your life wasn't really about conservation at all? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be about that would be right. Um, morning. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the first part of my life was, I think, uh, <clears throat> working part of my life. So, I guess from twenty to forty was really focused upon um, being in the furniture business, and uh, uh, that that was. I should have said that that should have been drawn short by probably five or seven years, but sometimes certain things have to happen for you to change. And uh, I think from the age of 20 to 40 was spent um, dealing in furniture, whether it be uh, in retail stores or importing, exporting or selling to others. But yes, it took me though into interesting places. It took me uh, close to nature. Because when you're buying furniture, you're buying timber, you're buying wooden products, um, you end up in countries and places where you're in forests. Now, I know those forests aren't necessarily old forests. They might be uh, manufactured forests. But still, those manufactured forests <clears throat> are close to the older ones. And you get a chance to go in there wherever it might be. So it could have been Brazil, could have been Finland, could have been South Africa, could have been Romania. And th- these these opportunities at the end of business trips um, gave me an insight as to wild nature and generally sort of fall in love with it. So you literally, I mean, I, I guess you, you came from an industry that was ravaging nature. Is that fair? I mean, well, I don't want to, I don't know. You know I think, I think, I think sensationalist about it, but using, you know, cutting down forests. Yes. For wood, yeah. Which we all use, frankly. Uh, we do. And I, and, I, and I say to people, there is no green business. Business is all dark. It's either light gray or it's black. And it's everything in between. So, you know, uh, at one end of the scale, you've got the really nasty stuff, and it could be uh, arms, it could be, um, uh, you know, oil, gas, I suppose, and things like this, and um, all sorts of nasty things. And then on the other side, you've got Patagonia Clothing, who's doing their very, very best to get people not to buy their stuff and recycle everything and um, and 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 make a big difference. And Yvonne Chouinard and has managed to achieve that and now given his company into a foundation. But um, yeah, I think I think uh, uh, the furniture business, well, we we were buying mostly from, uh, well, I'd say virtually all from plantations. Now, of course, those plantations to be planted were hundreds of years ago or more, were, were once original landscapes. So they've been altered. So yeah, in answer to your question, uh, they, they weren't, they're not, in, in our generations, they're not damaging, they're needed. I mean, we all need timber, we all need uh, paper, um, we all need, uh, you know, things like that. But but um, it, it's really, I'm going to say, it's a, it's, it, it's a, it, it was, a, it was, as far as I was concerned, it was a pretty, pretty well run business. And we weren't going into old growth forests like in, in, in Asia and places like that. We were staying pretty much on track with places um, in South Africa, for example, uh, up in the Drakensberg Mountains. They grow fast growing pines. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a very important industry for them down there. Um, but wasn't uh, probably before it was bush shrubs, original, a little bit of original forest, I suppose. But um, yeah, there's always some compromise when you talk about business. There's always something that needs to be compromised. We can't have it both ways, so to, so to speak. And then everything changed for you and now your mission and and the work that you've done has been extraordinary, the changes that you've made in the world, and we'll get on to some of that. But when that change occurred, what happened? Did you have an epiphany? Did you have a series of shifts? What changed for you in the sense that you went out from the world of being a businessman to the world of conservation and philanthropy? Yeah, that's uh, a good one. Uh, I guess uh, there was a series of events uh, that took place. And uh, there are about 
four or five things. And I suppose the, the biggest one uh, was my father's ill health. Uh, he had a stroke and uh, it was clear that he wasn't going to recover from that stroke. Um, and that put a lot of extra responsibility on me. And it was obviously a very sad time being in intensive care. And he him. was the business, wasn't he? Well, he, no, he it was, was a family he, business, he, yeah, in a sense. Well, or... he... he he had sold the business in, in 1985. And uh, I went on for another sort of 20 years, 15 years, no, 15 years, doing my own furniture business. So I'd spent five years in, in his business. Well, it was a public company at that point. So uh, it might have started as a family business, but it didn't stay there for long. Um, and then I... Um, and then I... I <coughs> I worked on my own independently. And I think uh, my father's ill health, plus also the realization that I wasn't quite the uh, entrepreneur or businessman he was. And uh, that was quite also a bit of a rude awakening because I, I had, I had a, a, quite a sort of a, a kind of growing retail furniture business at the time, but it was completely out of control. And... Um, uh, I, I, a good friend of mine, then Mike Ashley, who's now pretty well known in the retail space, had tried to buy my business twice, um, once from me personally, and then second out, out of administration, <laughs> and twice I chose alternative options. Boom. <laughs> so that goes to show you that, uh, you know, uh, making good decisions at the right time is all part of being an entrepreneur, which is a word that's used far too frequently. Everybody thinks they're an entrepreneur these days, but uh, I think that there's a difference between a business person and an entrepreneur. So, so anyway, I, I came to the realization that that um, the business was well, I had a business; it was spiraling. We, we didn't really have much control in it. We had about eight stores, and eventually, a company came over from Australia and did a deal and uh, bought the business out of administration. Um, I also, uh, you know, that I also had a um, uh, a long-term relationship that um, had to sort of change and, and come to an end. And, and then I had a lack of sense of smell, which I've suffered from ever since. So that was a bit depressing. I haven't gotten used to it now. But there was a few things that happened in the same year. And, um, and it kind of floored me. And um, I went to seek help in the deserts of Arizona, as anyone does. <laughs> um, I went off to a... Uh, it was a rehab place, actually. Um, but I was the only person in there that wasn't suffering from any addictions. I was just suffering from sadness and slight depression. And anyway, um, uh, a three or four weeks spell there. And I came back to the UK and I just decided what to do and to reinvent myself and do things that I was really passionate about, which was in some way getting involved with the nature business. But the funny story is, that my father, at, when I was 25 and he'd sold the business, he said to me, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to stay in the furniture business. And he, he looked at me sort of completely dumbfounded. And he said, he said, why? He said, well, I said, well, because I, I know, I know what's uh, the furniture. I've, I've learned about it. I know what to do. You know, I know how to source things and I can sell to Ikea and things like this and la, la. And he said to me, he said, well, why don't you go down the King's Road, rent, rent an office above a shop, put on a woolly sweater and sell trips to Peru? I said, what? <laughs> but, but he knew of, even then of my passion and interest in nature and my love for it. And, and, and he could see underneath all of that. I thought, well, that's what Paul should be doing. Paul should be in some nature connected business. And here I am all those years on right in the middle of it and it's quite funny because you know one of the two things i like to do each morning or each day is try and connect people to nature and make noise for nature i mean there are the two things that i do and and he kind of worked that out at my young age he kind of had it all figured out what i should be doing and i mean it must be so painful for some parents to watch uh, they, they their, their children evolve and grow go off in different paths like, oh my god <laughs> what are they doing you know yeah you know and you know there's no point in saying anything at all at no point you can say it out and if you say something it's going to make it even worse no no you can say nothing 
And of course, I Best went down the path nothing. for 15 years. So here's the message to all the younger people listening to this. Please, <laughs> every now and then, just stand back and do once on occasions listen to your parents. <laughs> so funny. So tell me now, I mean, the breadth of your work is extraordinary, as I've mentioned. It, give me a brief summary of all of the things that you're doing at the moment, and then we're going to dive deep into some of them. Oh, brief summary. Well, we, we, we tend to focus, a lot of our work um, is in Europe. That's why we have the European Nature Trust. Um, and it goes anything from uh, trying to establish a, a national park in Romania to um, saving a, a, a very rare felid in the Scottish Highlands to um, preserving um, some, some uh, endangered bears in central Italy. Um, and... But we also get involved with uh, organizing press trips. We love taking journalists into nature, uh, but not for just one or two days, no, for an immersive journey and really showing them some fantastic projects with amazing people that are, that are saving species from extinction or landscapes from being destroyed or campaigning. And a lot of people spend a lot of time doing amazing things but they're very, they don't talk about them much. They don't scream about them. And I think when we've got some good news these days, we need to share it. You know, I think that uh, 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 having all these amazing projects going on around the world and the ecologists behind them go, oh, no, no, don't say anything. No, 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 do. We want to attract more interest, you know, more collaboration and potentially more, more donors. <laughs> so it's a I very wide range. For us all to know that change can happen. I think is really empowering because it's so doom and gloom. It's so we're all our changes are going in the wrong direction. That seems to be the press. And for us all to know that change, good change in a positive direction can happen too. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, th that's what we really focus in on. I, I mean, my, my, my deepest thoughts are quite dark and we might get onto some of those later in the, in, in the podcast, but <clears throat> but I like to spend my time focused on really amazing mavericks around the world, particularly Europe, um, doing great things and teams of people that are out there fighting. Um, but we've got two issues here. We've got, we got the one group of people that are really doing all they can, and then you've got the less um, conscious people that are just going about surviving uh, in their regular day-to-day -day lives. And how do we get everyone to be conscious about what is going on in the world is the big key. So consciousness is a, is a word that I like to use a lot and humility. But yeah, so, that, so we get involved with communications. Uh, we get involved with wildlife conservation. Uh, we get involved with um, uh, uh, set, establishing protected areas. And we, and we also love having uh, film screenings and events particularly in London, because that's where a lot of our database are and people come to screenings of films and whatever we've been making. But on top of all that, more recently, uh, in the last decade, I've got involved with uh, Belize, which is uh, the one addition to, um, to Europe that we're involved with over there. And, uh, that's and that's how we met, because I was edit producing some of that with you. Um, yeah, and so exactly. tell us about Belize. What what are some of the issues you're facing there and why you, why did you get involved? Well, I think I went to, uh, I went to Belize only 15 years ago. I went years ago, maybe when I was in my twenties, I was um, on the reef there, but, but uh, more recently in the last uh, 12, 15 years, I've been back virtually every year. And uh, I just fell in love with the country when I first went there. And I, I remember a chap called Chris Minty, a friend of mine, took me over there and then we ended up um, in the Chiquibul Forest, uh, which is um, in, in central Belize. And we went up a, a bird tower in the morning. You hear the chorus of the birds, you look out over the jungle. And it's a very, very, very special place. And I instantly just fell in love with it. And I also feel the people are wonderful. Um, there's a very low population density. It's like 15 people per square kilometer. That's not the case next door in Guatemala. There's something like 40 times more population density, which is one of the issues facing Belize, is, will be the migration issue eventually. Um, but the people, the food, the landscapes, they've done an incredible job of protecting um, what they have. I mean, I would say something like 
70% of the country is pretty much in an original or old state. I won't call it virgin because state. They were quite they were quite forward thinking, weren't they, actually? You know, looking back 80, 100 years ago even, they were already starting to focus on, okay, we need to protect some of this. Yes. I mean, they don't forget, longer back in history, you know, they had the Mayans who, who did a pretty wholesale job of deforesting and putting out maize crops and things, and then eventually... You know, they that that uh, that that race sort of imploded um, because they changed the climate, and then everything ca- came back, uh, generally speaking. Uh, and then the Brits got over there um, and started doing their logging um, and taking out some some timber as well. So it's it's been a bit of a a, a rocky road, but but more or less, I would say, uh, more recently, absolutely, they they, they really do. Um, to tend to look after what the landscapes they have and and, and it's it's great to see uh, but there is always threats Though, of course the biggest thing in their favor is the the low population uh you know when you've got low numbers of people this is not i know what you're coming to not, i know what you're coming to <laughs> just before not applied, we even get there not applied, can we... low numbers of people <laughs> you have less less extraction but we also have in Belize a high, high biodiversity and high uh, habitat diversity. So you have everything from the reefs right up through to, uh, well, you know, cloud forests, well, you have, even you have almost. In, inland uh, wetlands like the Everglades, you have, uh, you have some savannah, which is a project I'm working on at the moment. Um, you have uh, what's called high pine forest, uh, pine ridge. Uh, you've got full-blown jungle. Um, and uh, yeah, you've got quite quite few ecosystems there. And then, of course, probably 20, 25 percent of the land has been cultivated in some way, either for agriculture or, or just conurbations and towns and so on. So, so when sorry, no, you carry on. on. When you go into a place, a project, an ecosystem, a, a species rescue, perhaps, what are you looking to do? You're looking. Am I right to say you're coordinating people? You're getting funding organised. Tell me what. You, so you go to a place like Belize and think, ah, right, we need to do something here. What goes on in your head? Oh. Because the, uh, this podcast is all about empowering people, right? To 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 look at a situation and think that something needs to be done here. And most people will walk away and go, well, I can't do anything. Okay, understood. understood. Why do you think you can? Well. You go to Belize, you see this incredible um, country, amazing people, natural hosts, um, beautiful climate, accessible to North America, I mean, very accessible. And, you know, having made a few documentaries and a few films and been involved with a few, um, you know, I thought to myself, well, you know, has anyone made any documentaries on on Belize, any films? And when you scour the internet and you look around, um, you don't see a lot of evidence of of uh, film production, there's some old films, very old, or there, you know, these features in some natural history films that have made just some sequences on certain species, but no one's actually made a film on the wonderful mavericks, the NGO leaders, their teams of people who are doing great work, hands on in the field, and you can only become inspired when you visit these people and you go with them into the forest and you see them climbing trees to count scarlet much core chicks or you or you see people working with howler monkeys or others trying to you know plant uh, replant coral that has that has died off or people that are doing work with with shark monitoring you know these are people that spend you know, their lives doing amazing things for very little return other than knowing that what they're doing is part of the solution, not the problem. And so when you see all of that and you see such a plethora of opportunities, I think to myself, well, we've got to get this on camera because this is worth recording. And even if it's just for the people in Belize to see um, how, their, how their fellows are doing amazing things uh, to protect their uh, ecosystems and landscapes and wildlife. So that's what went on in my mind in that instance. So what's the difference, though? Because lots of people would think that. Lots of people might think, oh, I'm going to make a documentary. 
or somebody needs to make a documentary. What's the difference between someone like you who goes, I'm going to own that and take responsibility and try and get this job done? Well, for me personally, uh, I mean, I've been on this journey for quite some time now. So I've kind of manifested the areas that I'm particularly interested and focused on. Uh, I'm also um, fortunate um, insofar as, you know, um, I have the ability to to spend my energy and time without all the time thinking about income, which is, I guess, not inspiring for some, but inspiring for others. And that gets to the people that have got um, financial ability and time to actually think about what they're doing with their lives and think about doing something with purpose. Um, and for me, having spent 20 years in the commercial world and then waking up, realizing that my father had worked particularly hard in his life and it created a nest egg, that I'm better off looking after that um, and, how can I say, living off a little bit of interest and then doing some good with it rather than just trying to repeat what he had done. Um, and and it's very difficult for the, the next generation to think like that um, because they always, okay, mostly some of them want to emulate and try and get that success that their parents did or, or, or they go off on the other direction. Um, so for me, I'm particularly enabled to do things like this. Um, I think if you have a passion that's so strong as mine, um, that it's it's a natural to want to be able to make do something that when you when you see an issue in in nature you want to um share that with with others um and making films is is probably a good way of doing that and hopefully that series will end up on amazon now and end up going with several streamers in north america it's been shown in belize um and uh, <clears throat> i think it's a it's a you know we made that we made that particular series for i think three reasons we wanted to we wanted to demonstrate to the Belizean people just how amazing their country was and the people are that, uh, that live there and doing work with the nature. Um, and we wanted them to feel particularly proud, even more proud than they are. We wanted to show uh, particularly people outside Belize, moreover in, in, in North America, what a special place Belize is and perhaps as a, an alternative to Costa Rica to visit. Um, and thirdly, we want to attract some inward philanthropic sort of um, interest in regards to the foundations we showed, we, we, we sort of filmed on the series for people to say, ah, oh, you know, I'd love to get involved with that. I want to fly over and see those those people and meet them. And and there's some business opportunities as well because Belize is, um, has got a, a, a really flourishing um, farming um, um, business but not enough of the products are upgraded and there are some very interesting people in there from the states setting up food processing um, manufacturing and exporting upgraded value-added products and i'm very keen on moving value-added products around not just bulk products so i know i've gone off on a tangent there philippa but uh, that's explained. i know i know but you're right you know instead of somebody selling honey for example sell <clears> something <throat> that's made with all sorts of yeah, you know, from the honey. Yeah, um, which is a well, rubbish this, example. Well, actually, case, I, I mean, know you've got better ones. Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> I mean, okay. Yeah, a good example would be um, the cacao, sugar, and milk industry. So all of them in Belize are, you know, pretty big, but they're exporting nibs in the raw form. They're exporting, you know, um, sugar sometimes in molasses and unfinished form, and then and then milk gets shipped out west of Guatemala in, in truck, in, in truck um, contain, tankers. If you put all three together, you can make a very nice chocolate product, you know, chocolate bar. <laughs> um, and then know. they're making more profit. Yeah, And more that profit, profit stays in Belize. Exactly. And, and there's many other yeah. examples. There's yeah. lobsters. I mean, they end up exporting lobsters to the Red Lobster Company in North America in their shell. I mean, you could have set up a cannery there and do all sorts of other things and add value to those lobsters. Um, but anyway, Belize is something, a uh, country that's come into the fold in the last five or 10 years, I would say, in regards to the work we do in the trust. You've also sometimes been in the public eye because you're, you can be quite controversial 
and outspoken. And there's two subjects that I'm really thinking of, one close to my heart, which is wolves and the reintroduction of wolves, which I've covered in Yellowstone in a book, but you were very much thinking Scotland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And I know that you have a close association with Scotland and that, mm -hmm. you know, you're – heart is there very much but also you've done good work rewilding up there can we really i would i would pitch against you on this one can we really reintroduce wolves into scotland no <laughs> yeah. so just to take the sting out of your tail young philippa uh no no, we can't. Oh, thank God no. for that. No, I no, don't we think can't. we can. No, we can't. No. Tell me all no. the reasons. No. But, you, but at one stage, no, weren't no. you? No, 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 no. That's, oh, the, that's the media. That's not me. I, I tell on, the then. same story. Let's clear this I tell, up. I tell the same story to 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 um, the media or whoever else from the last 20 years. And that is, we want to see wolves within a large 50,000 acre plus fenced area. So. Um, not a reintroduction, a release into a controlled area. And of course, when you mention wolves, everyone just goes reintroduction. That's the next thing they say. And it's not because if a reintroduction will be letting wolves um, out into the freedom of the countryside with no, um, with, with no, with, um, uh, and, and letting them just move around and they'd soon be in the suburbs of Glasgow after a couple of years. So that's completely, for me, impractical. And I really don't think there is anyone out there that really believes that we're ready for that. Um, even though some people might say it, I think deep down they realise. I think that we, we've got wolves in every country in Europe these days, but because there is no tunnel or bridge um, going across to the UK, they're not here. But our population density, the livestock we have, the pets we have, and uh, all the boundaries and problems with um, fences down railroads and motorways and highways and infrastructure and, uh, and so on, and, and nearly 70 million people, I, I just think it's a step too far. Now, um, Agreed. I, uh, to, to set up something in the Scottish Highlands of 50,000 acres, which would allow for two packs of wolves, would create a new rural economy based around uh, nature tourism. So, you know, uh, th that's it. It's it's very simple. I mean, Yellowstone has been the, the pointing case. Yellowstone, um, you know, since the war for introduction has uh, created 40 to $50 million a year additionality to the tourism revenues in the north, north of the park, directly attributable to since wolves have been released. Now, you know, if we were to bring wolves back into a call it a reserve, um, in the Scottish Highlands. You'd have 80 beds probably in there, over four or five lodges, uh, lobby hotels. You'd, you'd have probably 60 to 70 members of staff working directly there. And you'd have hundreds downstream. It would really do a huge, um, really a huge benefit to the communities up in the north of Scotland for bringing back families and the fabric of families. Can you imagine you know, having a family up in the Highlands and then you have two or three kids and then all of them decide to disappear off to Edinburgh or Glasgow or London or you know, uh, worse still, you know, Sydney or somewhere. So, so, you know, when you have opportunities in these rural places, then you have an opportunity of keeping the families together, which is what I think most people would like. Um, yeah, I think I, you're right. And I think, uh, so the press has been talking about Wolf, reintroduction that's they like to go but more but more recently i mean i remember 20 years ago the headlines were howling mad you know with the daily mail there was a double page spread and there was a picture of me and a wolf and it said howling mad <clears throat> but the journalists weren't writing down as we know what i was saying and i've always been trying to blend a south african game reserve with a north american project in yellowstone um, <clears throat> weld them together. And in South Africa, you know, when they wanted to bring back the big five, it wasn't a case of just um, buying a, a piece of land uh, uh, down there and saying, right, I've got 50 or 100,000 acres. I'm going to bring back lions and leopards. 
the land had been sanitized down in South Africa by man, and lots, a lot of the large predators had been wiped out because of livestock and shepherding and sheep and so on. And the same thing's happened here. You know, we've totally sanitized our landscape. Britain is probably uh, 100, about the 180, 185 most nature depleted country on the planet. You know, we're, we're alongside Haiti. So, you know, we've got a lot of work to do to put that right, which is the other thing that we're very keen on beyond the walls in Scotland is, is making a difference to the land and letting the land breathe, giving it a chance to breathe. Um, and we're very, we've been on this for like 20 years now, and it was a natural thing for me to want to do, was to plant trees and to restore our peatlands. They're the two things that, that really have been a problem up in the highlands, you know, lack of forest cover, uh, native forest cover, not just Sitka spruce or Douglas fir plantations, but I mean talking mixed woodlands. Um, and also the fact that we drained all of our peat some 50, 100 years ago, um, so we could put more livestock on the land. And of course, when you drain peat, when you put big drains right through it, that means water runs off that much faster. Uh, that means carbon escapes that was being locked in by that, those peatlands, carbon escapes up into the atmosphere, and, and you end up with you know flooding issues, and and you end up with a with a with a, a, a sort of denuded landscape. And now we've got no livestock anymore. We've got less livestock up in the highlands. We've got less. There's no need to use those lands for grazing. So that's why we like to um, re-wet them. We call it. We put dams into the into the drains. The water gets stuck behind the dams. It goes back into the into the peat bog, and then the sphagnum moss on the top comes back. Uh, and um, and we're seeing that happen at Allerdale now. And and so really the work we've been doing there for the last 20 years, for me, uh, it, not only, it, it, it's a sort of a demonstration as to what can happen for other landowners. We have people coming up to us from all over Scotland and Britain, and they see what we've done. And they go, yeah, we think that's great. We don't like that so much. We take this. So they, they take what they want. And I never preach to anybody what they should be doing. You know, I, I, my, my, my vision is an amalgamation of other people's ideas. I just put them together into one spot and other people yeah. come up to us and they can do the same with us. They can say, oh, we, we, we like what they're doing there, but we don't like the hospitality aspect. We think we can, you know, put a wind farm in or we think we can do something else. But we like to generate revenue and all of our, virtually all of our revenue is generated through, through tourism. Um, and, and we've got three lodges and uh, we have uh, 15 members of staff. And when we started at Aladale, there were three members of staff. And we were doing something like a tenth of the revenue we're doing now. So we've actually... And I... Uh, Carry go on. You go. Well, it's not just that for me. It's the way that you describe that, that kind of intricate beauty of an ecosystem that when you give it a chance, it, it recovers. And then you can use that as a showcase to show people just how, I mean, I, to me, that's the, that's the miracle. That's the marvel. That's the wonder of the, nat of, of the natural world. And, and I love that, yeah. you know, yes, make revenue because people need it, but also, um, you know, showing and showcasing that yeah. part of the natural world yeah. to me is, is amazing. I think, I think in Britain, we've been used to seeing a landscape in a certain way and it's generational and our eyes have become accustomed to what the landscape looks like. And we think that that is what it used to always be like. And that's the problem because we don't have uh, very many examples of really old growth forests. There's probably Patches of it in Scotland, you know, patches somewhere in the south of England, but really, it's, we've got the new uh, forest. We've got bits there. It's we've got bits. Very, yeah. very difficult to demonstrate what a, what an old forest looks like. So our la our eyes are thinking, well, you know, farmland is how it, it it looks like. You know, you go to the Lake District, that's what it looks like. You know, it's lots of sheep and 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 lovely stone walls and and so on and so forth. So when you become accustomed to it, and that's what you think it looks like, it's difficult for people to imagine 
what it should be like. And that's why it's important for people when they do travel, try and travel with purpose and try and travel somewhere for more than a week <clears throat> and try and go somewhere where you'll meet some locals and try and go to a rural place. So that said, where would you go in Europe? Where would I get, where did I get my inspiration from when it came to restoring uh, our little patch uh, up in the Highlands? Well, it came from Romania. Romania, um, the Apennines of Italy, and uh, the northern part of um, Spain with the Cantabrian Mountains, but particularly Asturias. These are, these are three examples. There are more. You can start talking about parts of Slovakia and Poland, and you can go up to the Baltic states and, and places. But, but, you know, there is, there is some still, not much, probably 5% of Europe, that is relatively sort of natural and, and unfarmed. I mean, as an example, if you flew from London to Istanbul for four hours and you looked out the window of the plane, you will see that we farmed the entire continent. We've managed to farm the entire continent, what it would look like from the air. Now, when you drill down into certain mountain ranges like the Cantabrians or like the Carpathian Mountains, or like the, you'll see some lovely forests but that's really representative of about 5%. The rest we farmed. <laughs> and, you know, it's our obsession with meat um, that has led us to that. You know, when you think about livestock production, you know, 27% of the earth's surface has been cut, burned, logged, and felled to grow livestock. That's 27% of the net space, take away ice and desert. That's the net space. And of course, of that 27%, it's not just lots of cows running around. No, it's the feed and the water to create winter crops to feed the cows. So, you know, we're, we're our own worst enemy. And the sooner we get a consciousness around that that is an issue, particularly for carbon and methane and erosion and, and soil disruption and flood mitigation, all these things, you know, the sooner we get heads around that, we sooner can reduce the amount of meat we consume. And... Um, <clears throat> eat more plants but that's another subject completely <laughs> it, it, but it all <clears throat> interconnects yes and i will bring you on to um because we I'm obviously we could then talk about europe forever because of the of the projects doing a deep dive in each of the projects that the european uh, nature trust is doing which are extraordinary in themselves. Can we can we do another three episodes with you, please? Uh, <laughs> I, I but actually, what we might do is speak to some of those people in in different episodes and and do a deeper dive into those projects because they're really amazing conservation work. Yeah. Um, but I would say then the other controversial subject that you're known for, and again, quite rightly so, I can't argue with you. Well, I was going to argue with you about wolves, but I'm not going to argue hmm. with you about this. You've mentioned a few times, and it's something that we can't shy away from, our population issue. Yeah, that's, um, that's actually the biggest challenge of all, um, is humans um, are absolutely the, the culprits for most of what is going on in the world today. It's, our, it's us and our consumptive behaviours that, that, that have created most of the challenges we face. <clears throat> and I think, I think that until people get and understand that, um, that we'll, we won't ever really solve the problem. Because it's, it's that desire to want to procreate um, that has tripled the population in one person's lifetime. So in the life of David Attenborough, the population has gone up from 2.7 billion to 8 billion. Now, you've got to be pretty, pretty dim not to realize that that's going to have an impact on our natural resources and our environment. We have one planet, one planet. There's no going off to different planets. That's just, that's just um, <clears throat> egotistical ideas and thoughts. I think... I think we've got one planet and we need to look after it because it, we depend on nature and nature does not depend on us. And so <clears throat> population is, is, a, is absolutely key in resolving 
the, the, the crisis we face. And when people say to me, oh, you know, I've got uh, um, a family of two or three and I'm going to bring them up to be good custodians of the planet and they're going to be very conscious young people and they're going to be involved with this. And Well, for me, I see the crisis a little bit closer than that. I don't see it being uh, 30, 40, 50 years away. I see it being right now. And every human being that's awake today needs to think very consciously about how they behave and what they do. And it's all about us. It's about the numbers, the sheer volume. And I gave you one example earlier about the meat industry. If we could just curtail the amount of eat we ate, um, then we could, we could, you know, we could be so much better off with landscapes recovering and 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 not being the the, the, the climate crisis we face. But but it's just an overwhelming issue, and I and I really am concerned that you know the policy that was made for China, the one woman one child policy, they deemed it didn't work. Well, no, no, because if you consider, it became uncomfortable. And of course, to get out of the straitjacket we're in, um, it's going to be uncomfortable. You know, we have to, we can't, no pain, no gain. So if the population in China all became more old, or they, there were more men born, or whatever the challenges were, yes, yes, that's what's going to be an outcome. Yeah, absolutely. For the next 40 or 50 years, we have to deal with it. But then you talk about a reducing population, then the capital markets don't understand reduction. They only understand growth. So when we look at the stock market, we just want to see it going up. We want to see yields improving and we want to see everything growing. So how can you have a declining population yet see everything grow? So that's also a problem. There's a, there's a problem with the political system we have. You know, when you think about it, <clears throat> we have 195 countries in the planet, all with different political views. We have 4,200 religious groups and we have 8 billion primates pretty much out of control. <laughs> so when you add all those things together, how do you come to harmony? Well, what happens is that when you have children, your mindset generally thinks, well, I've had those kids, so their, their generation is going to be fine. You know, next 50 or 70 years, it's going to be okay, because otherwise, why would you have done that? If you think, like I do, that we got some more immediate challenges, you might think twice about wanting to have a family because of how they would be later on. Now, I think the problems I'm going to see, some challenges, big challenges in my lifetime. We got hit by COVID. That's just something relatively small. Something bigger is out there. We got how many different wars have we got going on in the world right now? So I do have a pretty doomongster view of us and, and, and humans and, and what we're doing with all those factors I've mentioned. But of course, people want to feel there is hope, but there is hope, but it will come with change and, it, and that change won't be considered comfortable. It'll be different. It won't be necessarily uncomfortable. It'll be different. And it's about making those changes. It's about making those changes and collectively doing it as one species we are one species after all but we're divided into 195 countries and all those religions but we're homo sapiens how come that's happened <clears throat> how is it that we think that we a lot of people think we stand above the natural world and that we're in control of it no 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 it very much controls us <laughs> we, mm -hmm. we, we that's true. without the natural world i remember a story that doug tompkins the founder of north face and esprit and my great mentor and uh, the founder of um, uh, Tompkins Conservation in South America. And, and uh, he was telling me a story that he was at Berkeley University with Steve Jobs. And they used to debate all day and night, the two of them were like this, about what was the future of humanity. And um, Steve would say that technology will save us. We'll invent our way out of everything. You know, we'll have a phone and we'll have applications and we can sort everything out. You know, we can, we can invent our way. We can create new, invent this, invent that, invent the other. And Doug would say <clears throat> that nature and beauty will be our savior. So I think if we can do both of them uh, and combine them, then I think we have some hope. But if we just think that technology is going to be our savior, well, I wouldn't want to be around 
with a life completely dominated by technology and without the chance to walk in a forest and to take time and to breathe and sit in silence without some phone ringing or some screen going off or some noise somewhere. So we are facing a crisis and it's all to do with us. And if we can come collectively together and deal with the big issues, which is population, which in my view is meat consumption and the suffering that goes with it, um, then I think we can be a, in, a, in a far better place. But it's going to take a big change. And of course, when people have children, this is another point I want to get over. When you have children, your mindset in the, in the main becomes one of hope. So when you're, when, if I make an analogy here, so if you're in the car and you're trying to slow down and get everything to slow down, instead of taking your foot off the accelerator and putting it on the brake, your foot stays on the accelerator. It doesn't go down anymore, but it just stays there because you've got to keep the ball rolling for the next generation. The economy has got to keep going and keep moving so they've got jobs doing things. But what's needed by every citizen is to come off the accelerator and put the foot on the brake. And therein lies the problem. Are we able to do that? Because putting your foot on the brake is going to seem uncomfortable and in some cases painful. And, you know, no pain, no gain. If we're going to get out of the climate crisis, it's not going to come by, you know, flying in a more fuel efficient jet around the world or whatever it might be. It's going to come about from absolutely doing probably less than you've done before and doing more meaningful things. So I talk about purposeful travel. So instead of going on, you know, 10 flights a year, weekend breaks here and short stops here and a wedding there and a, and a, and a, and a concert there and a football game there. No, no, try and consolidate your trips into longer but less trips. So when you go somewhere, try and go somewhere and actually do a deep dive instead of just skimming. I talk about this travel industry as skimming, dipping, and diving. Skimming is those short trips I spoke about. Uh, dipping is when you go for a week or two and you actually unpack your bags, <laughs> you know, like you often don't. You unpack your bags, put them into the, into the closet or whatever. Um, and a dive is when you actually go away and you, you work remotely and you decide you want to go somewhere far away for a, a month or two or three. So if we can change some of the patterns we have, some of the habits we have, you know, I think there's hope, but we've got to, we've got to be prepared to compromise. And that doesn't come from just finding some app. I mean, a lot of that are things we do on our phones, they are useful. I mean, the idea of having, you know, zip cars running around. I don't have a car. I've not a car for 20 years. So having a zip car or or using Uber, or using more often actually the underground or a bus service is great. But of course, everyone thinks they need a car. But how many hours of the day do people actually sit in their cars for? It's probably like 2% of the hours of the week that you're actually in the car. The 98% of it is sitting outside in your garage. <laughs> so everybody's got to have a car. I mean, and even to a degree, you know, as you said, it's a combination of the two things. Look at this, zooming you know, or, or or doing it online means that neither of us are, are using carbon to travel to each other and all of the rest that that entails. So, you know, there are there well, are reasons. There are, that, that, we're back, and, we're back and, to technology again. Well, you know, yeah, in the sense that, you know, because I'm with you and I get motivated by the beauty, I get motivated by the awe, I get motivated by the systems of nature even, the fact that it fits, as I said, intricately, uh, you know, that inspires me. It's bigger than us. Uh, however, I can also see where technology is actually potentially helping us. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. And that's why I think, you know, um, those things I mentioned will help us. But I'd be curious to know, and here's something for us to research, is since the 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 popularization of zoom and all the other apps you can have video conferencing on since that's happened how much has the airline industry shrunk 
you know, so the mere fact I can talk to anyone in the world like I am with you now, and it feels like it's around the corner. How much has the airline industry shrunk? Well, it won't have, because they're all gunning to get more people on seats, and we're bombarded by media advertising, and we're brainwashed by what we watch online to go on more trips and discover more places and go more frequently. So as a complete juxtaposition to what you said and how hopeful we are about these particular apps, one interesting statistic would be to think, well, just how much less flying is there going on? How can we measure it? How do we measure how successful online meetings are um, and how that would have impacted against business travel? Well, I put it to you that I reckon we're back to where we are pre-pandemic uh, amount of flying and that yes this is wonderful but it hasn't actually impacted the amount of travel we do now we're not trying to see each other but we may be spending that time and energy and resource going somewhere else on leisure so so it's a, you know you get me into this sort of crazy eight vortex of of but but <clears throat> of course we have to be hopeful but hope only comes with change and it comes with meaningful change, and it will come with uncomfortable change or seemingly uncomfortable. And until we can make those choices um, and decisions, you know, the trajectory for me doesn't look so encouraging. Um, I'll give you an example, uh, if I can. In Britain, there are two million deer, two million deer, wild deer, of which there are six species. Two are native, the other four are exotic that we've brought in from other parts of the world, released, and now they're running around in the wild. We've got two million deer. Um, Philippa, the carrying capacity of a, a landmass the size of Britain is half a million deer, half a million. Wild venison is probably the healthiest meat anyone could want to put into their mouths, like above everything else. It's insanely lean and it's healthy, and it's wild shot. It wasn't put into a slaughterhouse, and it wasn't raised on, sub, on, on all sorts of feed, 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 feed item, food items. It's absolutely wild. Yet the British public, <clears throat> despite venison being low in price than lamb, beef, and uh, pork, low in price, um, we still want to buy the manufactured items that we've reared in food lots, wherever they might be in Texas, Brazil, or even our own country. And, and sometimes industrialized farming like pig farming. We still want to eat bacon that has been brought up in horrific conditions. Why don't we, why don't we eat more venison? Because the supermarkets don't like change. They are thinking, oh, we've got this amazing business going right now. Why do we want to rock the boat? So to get a supermarket to step up and go, you know, for the greater good of humanity and livestock and everything else. We're going to get right behind venison. We're going to cook it into bolognese, into ragouts, into chili con carnes, into goulashes. We're going to make it for the British public so they don't have to pick it up in the supermarket shelves in a raw form. We're going to cook it up and you're going to take it home, put it in the oven and whatever. No, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. And yet those two million deer mean that our landscape is compromised hugely. We, we have to fence everything to allow trees to grow. I mean, you know, where there are large numbers of deer, they just browse saplings in submission. And now we've just, got no walls yeah. to move them on. Well, that's the problem. <laughs> As you know, when there's, where you've got a trophic cascade with large carnivores at the top of the, of, the, of the triangle, other species are kept in check. But when you don't have large carnivores, it's up to man with a rifle to do the job. And in Britain, we're not doing a very good job. There's two million deer. Go to Richmond Park. People think, oh, Richmond's amazing. It's wonderful. <coughs> I can tell you, there are 20 to 30 times more deer in that park than should be there. It's just nothing but a, 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 it's like a Serengeti. I mean, it's just terrible. And then people think, well, you know, that's how nature is. They call it a nature park. There's nothing more natural about that, that area than, than I can think of. It's terrible. So, you know, the, our food systems need to be looked at. And Britain has just the most incredible example of wild venison that is a resource that is out there and it's natural. And it's, there's one and a half million uh, you know, deer more than the land can actually carry. 
due to the lack of... And as you said, it's a super healthy, lean meat. Absolutely. And something that we could all do. We can all do this week. Yeah. Change, switch, Change. switch some of our switch, meat to venison. Switch. And that's, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's that, isn't it? It's that being conscious of our everyday decisions and how, and the impact that they have. Yeah. Clothing is another huge, huge, you know, you want to, you want to buy less clothes. You know, you go downstairs into my wardrobe. How many shirts have I got? I'm embarrassed. How many shirts can I possibly wear in a, in a month or a week or whatever? And yet, look what I've accumulated and I'm very good now at controlling my shopping that's for sure but you know the fashion industry is very strong and they will bombard us with things on our lovely iPhones advertising selling us go down to that store or go online and buy this sweater it's so easy you know everything is made so easy and so then it's we go oh, why don't we just get those we got we got it in one color let's get the other two colors why do you need the other two colors why you know, and uh, I, it's a, it's a, it's an industry we all get we all get trapped into, and it goes right back to education, and it goes right back to what we're taught at school. And the most important thing, which we haven't spoken about in this podcast, I guess, is the school curriculums. What are we teaching young people? What are we teaching them in schools? We're teaching them history, physics, chemistry, biology, English, mathematics, whatever. Why don't we treat, teach them? Humility, consciousness, place, and how to be good custodians and good citizens. How to be a good a, a son, a daughter, a brother, a sister, a parent, a cousin, a friend. How to be a loyal person. How to be a good human being. I think far too much time is spent in, calls, in schools doing memory tests. Why aren't we teaching them these things? Why aren't we teaching them about what it costs to bring a, a child into the world? What is the cost to, to have a child? How much will it cost you to have your second child. So let's just say each child costs four hundred thousand pounds, three hundred four hundred thousand pounds to bring up. Hmm. Did we actually think about that before we decide to have two or three? Do we actually understand that? Do we know how much extra work is involved to bring up those kids? Do we know that? Do we know how much more Uber driving we got to do, or how much more bricklaying we got to do, or how much more office work we got to do, or how much more factory work, or how much more flying we got to do? to be able to create an income to, to, to pay for those children. I know we got onto the emotional side of having families, but what about the financial impact of it? What about the actual financial impact of having a person born into this world? What does it cost? Does anyone, is anyone, does anyone know that before they do it? Before we, we fall in love and we have our wonderful, lustful time, and oh, children, children, 50% of people get divorced. So you've done all this wonderful thing, you've brought up this lovely family, and then it's broken apart because we got divorced. So, you know, gosh, I think actually, scrap everything I've said on this, on this podcast, scrap it all, scrap it all. Let's start again. Let's start with the most important subject, which is education. Because if we were taught to be the right custodians um, uh, of the planet and to be, have humility, and we all did yoga at school, and we did a bit of humming and chanting and meditation, maybe we'd be that much better off in the future. But I think we need a radical shift in the schools and what we're, what we're taught at school and what will become really useful in life. What will become really useful? You know, and, and that's having the, 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 the background and, and the, 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 the knowledge that we are just... We're just a, a tiny, tiny uh, uh, sort of fleck of, of, of sand on a beach. But we need to, to, to realise that, but to realise that we're, we're also at the same time collectively very important. And I, I just think that somehow we need to change the, the education system because, because it's, we are the problem. And until there's less of us and the planet of 8 billion, we can't, it can't be sustained. Or as you say, until we act as grains of sand in a in a wind, or all, all blowing in the same direction, then we can sustain massive change. Massive but change. It, it boils down to individual actions every day. But and I, hopefully, I, I, you know. But I, I, I like to make um, I like to make documentaries, as you know. And uh, one of the latest ones that I thought about, and and someone's got to write the story, is I wanted to make a. a a documentary called Sex and Suffering. 
I know it sounds like it could be a bit naughty, but you know, the more sex we have, the more sex we have going and we expand, the more the natural world declines. It's directly related. If we reduce the amount of us that are on the planet, the suffering will come down. And so I think sex and suffering is a is a story that needs to be told. The more we go up, the more we expand, the more we grow, the more everything else in the natural world will have to diminish for us to for us to grow. Um, but anyway, that's just in the pipeline at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I know uh, you're so busy, and I really appreciate uh, you taking the time. Uh, thank to, you for the opportunity to come and speak with us uh, today. For, for, uh, and me you to and me. I will talk again, no doubt. Yeah, we will.